All right. We're going to call the meeting to order 7.31 p.m. This is a virtual meeting of the select board. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Stu and Mr. Studo. This meeting is being recorded by the town of North Reading as well as uh, NORCAM. We're going to begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United okay. States of America okay. and to the Republic okay. for which it stands, okay. one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our first order of business is public comment. So if there's anyone here who wishes to speak during public comment, you can raise your hand, wave your hand, um, put something in the chat room. Etc. Anyone here to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next order of business, which is the COVID 19 update. Mr. Gilberto. Yeah, just one second. Public, is uh, uh, vocational school representative uh, Judy Diamond on? Mr. Gilberto, because I knew she wanted to uh, address the board and the public. I'm not seeing her yet, no. Not seeing her yet. Okay, so Madam Chair, if I might uh, ask for um, some relief if uh, Mrs. Diamond comes on, that you'll grant her um, the ability to make some public comment when she comes on, because I know she texted me and said she was looking to uh, to get on. Okay, well, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Maybe we'll be done by eight, and she won't be joining until <laughs> like fifteen. And if that, in that case, she's going to be out of luck. So, all right. So we're going to move on to the COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I will uh, just first start with, uh, so the, I guess with a general statement that as we all know, there's quite a bit of COVID-19 activity that's been happening in the nation, uh, in the state. Um, and uh, that's also the case here locally in, uh, in North Reading. Our COVID-19 working group continues to um, work to respond and to address um, the prevalence of COVID-19 here in the community, just as we have since um, just about two years ago uh, in January and February of 2020, before the virus became overly um, prevalent here in the nation. Um, so we, we continue to meet um, pretty much weekly with the superintendent of schools, the police chief, public safety director, the fire chief and uh, public health director as well. Just to give um, folks a little bit of uh, data point with regard to the, the activity, the two biggest indicators that we look at, the 14 day average daily incidence rate in North Reading, 143.7 cases um, per 100,000 residents. And then the uh, 14 day percent positivity um, at 16.85% here in North Reading. So those are numbers that um, are, are certainly very high with regard to the activity of the virus. I don't think that that's any surprise for folks to hear at this point, we're all well aware of it. Um, just to give an update with regard to the, uh, the status of uh, you know, our, our operations, um, all three of our buildings continue to be open to the public, our non-emergency uh, buildings, meaning the town hall, the senior center, and the uh, public library. Um, we continue to um, ask those who come to uh, wear a mask when they come into the building. Our employees are wearing masks when they leave their workstations and when they're interacting with the public in those buildings. <clears throat> um, like anybody else, uh, you know, we have seen um, staffing related um, issues, although we've been able to deal with those issues within the constraints of our workforce. Um, and I would classify it as, uh, you know, a handful of town employees across all departments that are out and or have been out at any given point in time, um, and then um, come back, um, you know, no sooner than the five days at this point in time, that's currently the CDC recommendation for isolation, um, and then wearing a mask for the second five day period, which gets them to the 10 day quarantine isolation that we're all probably familiar with at this point. Um, so, you know, we've been able to, uh, you know, to continue to, 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 to deliver the municipal services, um, with folks who are, are working, stepping up um, to fill open shifts um, and uh, to cover and provide the services really no differently um, than I think any of us would expect from our workforce. I, I know we all hold the workforce in high regard and our employees are all uh, amongst all departments, very dedicated. And um, they continue to show that um, going through this. 
um, difficult time in the pandemic. Um, I mentioned the school department. I think everybody's aware the school buildings um, did reopen uh, after the the winter break uh, in December, um, and uh, you know they are similarly working through any staffing related issues, and they have also seen um, certainly a number of staffing related absences, staffing absences, staff absences related to COVID, as well as student absences as well. The guidelines have been changing, uh, not just for the CDC, but for the state and then through the state to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And um, the superintendent's directly involved working with the nurses to adjust their protocols in order to continue to provide um, a, a safe uh, learning environment, both in terms of COVID and in terms of maintaining the appropriate level of staffing. Um, and you know, that will continue to be the, the, the case, I'm sure. Um, just to continue uh, with regard to the COVID uh, update, one thing that we are um, working on and have been working on to the public health director for the past nine days or so is to try to bring more testing um, here to North Reading. Um, and we have um, been engaged in a, in a discussion with a third party contractor um, that would potentially operate a testing site here in town uh, multiple days a week uh, for a uh, a period of time. Still working through the details of that, and if that does come to fruition, uh, we will certainly make that make that widely known to the public, um, so that folks can take advantage of it. Uh, we know that testing um, resources are scarce, that wait times are very long, um, and you know we are hoping we can do something to um, supplement um, that by offering this service, which would be at no charge to the town nor at uh, any charge to our residents, as I understand it, uh, as it would rely on insurance. And in the case of an employee, uh, excuse me, of a resident who did not have insurance, um, the federal government actually will reimburse for the cost. Um, so that would certainly be a great thing as well. Um, we, we have been looking at whether or not purchasing at-home test kits is something that we should be um, doing and can do. Um, and, and we are, I think, concerned about the lag time and the, the test being made available. Um, versus uh, a much shorter turnaround to get this program up and running um, potentially as soon as next week or early the week after versus a, a week or two beyond that to get test kits delivered here to North Reading for distribution within the community. Uh, but we're going to continue to pursue those options <clears throat> and make decisions. We are ordering some test kits for um, the employee base and uh, have opened a conversation with the schools as well to make sure they're appropriately equipped with tests for staffing as well. And again, I'm talking about the uh, Binax or, or similar at-home tests that I think we're all familiar with at this point um, that can be administered by a resident. Um, so I'm going to stop myself there. I know that, that that's a lot um, with regard to what's going on. Um, you know, we're um, trying to continue to stay ahead of it. <clears throat> Obviously, the biggest challenge right now is just maintaining staffing and you know, fortunately for us, uh, we've been able to to get through that. Uh, we we did not see significant impact in our snow uh, and ice event on Friday compared to some communities that, that did. I think we were um, fortunate in that standpoint where we had some folks who had just come off quarantine and were able to jump back in the workforce for that storm. Um, the one area where we are struggling the most, as I think the whole town has seen, is with regard to the collection of trash. Um, JRM um, is struggling, not just here in North Reading, but in all of their client communities with maintaining their schedules. And um, I, I think, you know, at this point, our best advice to residents is to, um, to expect delays uh, in the coming weeks as they are dealing with a, a staffing shortfall, long wait times at Covanta for disposal, uh, and also the very shortened window with uh, um, the, the number of daylight hours being what it is in the middle of the winter. Those three factors are conspiring against uh, getting the, the pickups done in, in one day. Um, and again, you know, point of you know, relevance, the snowstorm didn't help, but did put off our Christmas tree, tree uh, collection to this coming Saturday. Uh, tree should be free of ornaments and tinsel and curbside by 6.30 a.m. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Madam Chair, I should offer too that the Board of Health is scheduled to meet Wednesday evening um, to review the status of the COVID-19 uh, response. Great, thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I think that was a pretty lengthy and comprehensive COVID-19 review. So, um, yeah. Ms. Earlier, I see you have your hand up. Do you have any questions or? Yeah, yeah just questions, comments, and. Uh put it into a little bit of context as to where we were there at our last meeting just three weeks ago. Um, 
and where we are today. And again, the town administrator has done a good job of uh, summarizing where we are today, but I think it's important to, to understand and I think everybody's been experiencing, uh, you know, a lot of families uh, like our own, even experienced some delays in the holiday celebrations because of uh, people contracting COVID. And, um, my family was part of the victim, <laughs> victimized by it too, but just, just to put it in context, you know, since our last, last meeting, the three-day average rate of cases have gone from about 4,500 per day to was today was 20,000 per day. There were over 60,000, almost 61,000 cases reported over the from Friday. Um, so from 4,500 to 20,000 cases a day, there have been 725 more deaths in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts just in three weeks, and that, that represents almost four percent of all of the 20,000 deaths that have occurred in the last two years. So now there's uh, 2,923 hospitalizations. That's up by over a third just from three weeks ago, over 33%. And the positivity rate for the state is now 22.39%, was only a 4.97 three weeks ago. For North Reading, we have 491 new cases in three weeks. It's up 23.7%. Cases in the last 14 days, which is what the average is what we've been looking at over the last year or two, is, is up 158 cases from 201 to 359. That's up 78% just in three weeks. So the Board of Health is very busy these days. And the positivity rate <laughs> is up from 9.82 to 16.85%. Um, uh, so it's a significant increase it's just in the last three weeks. And I know everybody's aware of what's going on across the Commonwealth and across the nation. But it's important that uh, people realize, you know, the Board of Health will be meeting uh, Wednesday night. A lot of communities around us are now imposing uh, some mask mandates, again, for indoor spaces and, and retail spaces. And, you know, whether the Board of Health is going to do that yet or not, I won't know until Wednesday evening, but uh, certainly on the table and it's something that they should be considering. And I think what's important is that we as a board should be sending a message in support of the Board of Health taking appropriate actions to protect the general public. So whatever they deem to be in the best interest of the community as a whole, doing our small part is not threading in, in concert with other surrounding communities and across the Commonwealth. I think it's important for us to send a message to the uh, Board of Health that we're, we're in full support of how they're handling things at this up to this point, but moving forward. And this is something that's not gonna go away soon. It appears as though it's gonna be with us for a long time. And uh, you know, masking may be in, an inconvenience it appears as though you know most people are, are doing it anyway and complying. And for those that aren't, you know, we just ask them to do it, get vaccinated, get boosted. Uh, they're putting on clinics for boosters. They're looking to put on clinics for testing. Um, keep checking the website, looking for the notices. And uh, again, I think we should send, send a strong message to the uh, Board of Health that we're in full support of what they're doing. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Does anyone else have any comment or question? Um, Mr. Studo. Just two numbers because maybe they're a little uplifting. I think it's a silver lining because uh, I feel like um, this has affected so many people, including mine. My brother missed uh, Christmas and my mother actually has COVID as we speak right now. Not sure exactly where they got it because they never leave the house. But anyways, that's a, that's a whole different thing. But I do have two numbers that, again, relative to what's going on puts things in perspective that as bad as things are how much worse they can be so in massachusetts and thank you mr o'leary for those numbers because i was looking at the same thing the survival rate for covid okay 1.247 million cases twenty thousand deaths 99.984 so that's a better survival rate than the general flu and if we take the entire population of mass, it's 99.997. The only reason I bring it up is because I feel like a year and a half, two years ago, we didn't have those numbers, right? We didn't know where we were going to do. But right now, we have enough data that I feel that should be a little comforting. You know what I mean? I'm a numbers guy. So to me, if you told me that there's something going around that's really bad, but I have a 99 0.984 chance of living if I get it, I'm going to feel a little bit better. So again, it's just like, I, I'm not trying to diminish it, but I'm just trying to say that we weren't able to give these numbers 
anyone, right? The data is the data. Like we didn't have this two years ago and we were like, oh my God, what if like, you know, 5% of the pot, like, you know, what if it was like a 5% debt rate? That'd be so bad. So I just wanted to point out that that is the silver lining that it does seem that the, the, the case counts and the death count is not going up proportionately like past variants. The, the spread, like every day we're reporting hundreds of thousands of more cases in this country above where we were, but the deaths are, are kind of stabilized. So I, I'm just trying to put a silver lining to the, you know, to the numbers. So that's it. Thanks, Mr. Studo. Any, and and uh, I'll, just, I'll just add to that in both of your statistics, that that's just a demonstration that the vaccination is doing what it needs to do here because we didn't have it back when this first began and now that we have it, we know that it doesn't prevent the transmission. It's an easily transmittable, obviously an easily transmitted virus, which the numbers show us, but the vaccinations also show us that it does quite a bit to mitigate the symptoms and mortality of the virus. So it's, it's, it's great data to show us the science behind why it's important to get fully vaccinated. And I'll also add to, to the discussion of COVID-19 that it would be very helpful if our website had an easily accessible, you know, maybe like a ticker tape or something on the, the homepage where, where this information can be right there so someone can click into it. When is the next, you know, when is gonna be the next, um, you know, vaccination, day site, what have you. A lot of times when I'm looking for information on our website, it's buried somewhere in some departmental, buried within a department um, page of the website or link on the website. And we really should have this information very accessible to the public, not just for people like me who know how to use the computer and know how to navigate a website, but for people that might not have that you know, all of those capabilities as they can just go to town of North Reading and they see they can just click into this. You know, where is it going to be? When is it going to be? You don't have to try to find it somewhere, buried somewhere. It's, it should just be, you know, even just an emergency alert up at the top. Of, you know, you certainly don't want to alarm people, but, you know, COVID alert, you know, something like a banner or a ticker or something. So that it's it's we're not hunting around for this information. I think just in terms of the trash, I think that's another important thing that you did do the reverse nine one one call, and I appreciated that the administration did do that for us and you know let us know. But I also think it's important for us to have that accessible on the website so people people can find it there. You know maybe they don't pick up their phone because they don't recognize the number. Um, but I do want to say thank you to, to the Board of Health and the administration for all the effort. And it's going to be ongoing, like Mr. Studo said, Mr. O'Leary said, this isn't going away, but we still have to follow the, the basic, you know, the basic guidelines, wash your hands, don't sneeze in someone's face, cover your, cover your mouth, wear your mask, all of these things, go get your vaccination it's proving that this data that you both have just cited is proving that the vaccination is working to mitigate or minimize really the mortality that this was causing previously. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has anything to add, but we have, you know- Mrs. Gonzalez has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Mrs. Gonzalez, you're muted. Thank you. No, um, actually, um, Vincenzo, um, I, I agreed with his numbers and I just, you know, I, I don't want to, we've all heard this gloom and doom for two years, you know, and it is getting better. And I, I know that, you know, this is a very contagious strain, um, but it's, it's less harming than the strains we've had before. It's gotten weaker. Um, it's easier to handle. It's not making people as sick. Um, so I, as much as I know that the numbers are increasing and we all still need to be careful and nobody wants to be sick, but um, 
it's a little bit of an easier strain. And, you know, I just feel like let's not gloom and doom it forever. You know, it's not the end of the world. I had it, it was like a bad cold. I mean, if you're fairly healthy, you can get through it pretty good. Um, <clears throat> that's all. Just Madam Chair, just in relation to the mortality. Oh, rate. I wanted to see if Mr. Waller has sure. anything to add. It's only fair if Mr. Yeah. Waller wants to add anything to this discussion. And then I can see Mrs. Hurlbitz wants to get, wants to also contribute and we're, we welcome you too. But let's hear Mr. Waller. We never yeah. get to hear from you. So yeah. I'll speak up a little bit. Um, <laughs> You know, you mentioned the reverse 911, and I was thinking about that. It would seem appropriate, like we're in the middle of this surge right now, right? And I it, I think we could send out a very positive message to people by using the reverse 911 to encourage them to voluntarily mask up when they're in our town. And we could do that tomorrow. We could get that up. We could get that up there right now. Say, even though we don't have a mandate, we're really asking everybody, if you're in a public space, please put your mask on to protect yourself and protect your neighbors. Very positive message. And let's use that reverse 911 to get that message out. And at the same time, at every street that enters our town, let's put up a sign that says, we are a voluntary mask community. You know, like we are telling you, if you come into our town, our expectation is you're gonna, we're asking you to wear the mask. We're not mandating it, but we're asking you to wear it just to help protect us as a community. We could have that done in two days, and we do that during January, just to just to get people to really pay attention during this time, and appeal to people's good senses, and not maybe a mandate works, and maybe that's where the Board of Health will go. But I'd rather do this in a very positive message way because our goal is to change behavior, not to impose things on people. I don't think we get good response out of that, and I think we'll get a better feeling out of people if we say positively, please wear your mask in public, especially during the month of January till the numbers subside. And then, you know, at, at every entrance to our town, let's post a sign that just says we're a voluntary mask community during the month of January. And if we have to do it again in February, let's do it. We just don't know if that's gonna be the case with the Board of Health yet. Yeah, so, so I'm encouraging them to- I, I think that's a great suggestion as long as we take our Really, we take our guidance and have reciprocity with the Board of Health and whatever the Board of Health deems necessary. So they understand, you know, but understand. maybe just wait on that until they do meet on Wednesday. And then, then you know, if, if Mr. Gilberto, if you're, you know, if that's something you could do based on whatever instructional guidance the Board of Health, I think we'd all be on board with that, right? I think it's a great idea. Voluntary, I think, is always better. I think you'll get will get a better response. Yeah, well, we we really have to be guided by what our you know public health experts tell us is needed for our community, though. So I would say don't do it tomorrow because yeah. it might the messaging might need to change two days from two days from then, you know. But it's a great idea. I agree. It's a great idea use that system to get the information out. I think it's a great idea. More important than our Christmas trees, frankly, picking up the trash. It's the more, more important message. So let's use it, you know, during this, this bit of a surge, let's use it for that purpose, you know? Okay. Well, there's a lot of talk about trash, so. Yeah. All right, Mrs. Harrell, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Only that um, I think we need to be very careful about deciding that Omicron is a mild disease. It really depends on who gets it and what their vulnerability are. The other piece of it is although the uh, mortality rate may be lower, the hospitalizations are ridiculously high. Um, and just, you know, you know, when you have the National Guard being called in to help do things in nursing homes and hospitals and whatever else, that's a really bad situation. And a lot of hospitals have had to postpone other kinds of procedures, which while they may not be emergencies to the person that can't walk because they need a hip, it is an emergency. Um, and, and in addition, um, I think that it's a trickle down effect or a trickle up effect. In other words, if everybody in North Reading gets COVID, clearly that's gonna add to the burden and, and, and just sort of scatters. And I know a lot of people that have had COVID 
lately and some of them has been a walk in the park and others have lost their sense of smell and are still really quite sick. And in addition to that, there is still a small amount of Delta going around. And now we have a new wonderful thing, which is a combo Delta and Omicron that's just come on the market. So I think we just have to be, I think that to play catch up um, or not do our part in a more global sense rather than just in town would be a mistake. Thanks, Mrs. Hurlbut. Okay, so I we're good with this topic. I think we can we can move on. I think because we can debate this, we can reach a common ground, and I think it would be good and wise to. I think we're all in agreement. Use the reverse 911 to get the messaging out there. Whatever that messaging is going to be directed by the board of health. Okay. And uh, keep safe and follow the guidelines and get your vaccinations and um, be safe. And that's pretty much the, you know, there's not really, I can't say that there's positive or silver lining out of any of this. However, if we can, flip it around like Mr. Walner suggests and do positive messaging. I think that that's a great idea. All right, let us move on. We have, we're joined by uh, Chief Stats on the next yeah, order of business, which is the presentation of this North Reading, um, North Reading Community Connect program, which is something that we had Mr. Uh, Chief Stats appear because of his because it was included in our, well, some of us may have, some of residents may have received this in their, in their uh, tax, um, tax billing. And so we asked Chief Stats to come in and talk with us about the, um, give us a little explanation. So welcome, Chief. Welcome, good evening. So the Community Connect program uh, is something that the fire department is pretty excited about, and I personally am. It's, uh, it's part of a bigger program called First Do. Uh, and First Do is a pre-incident management software platform. First Do leverages a lot of different things. First Do leverages the GIS platform, as well as uh, locally and publicly available data, assessors data on buildings. Um, recently, I uploaded all the, the water department hydrant locations, which they were kind enough to GPS, and they're very accurate right now. Um, Another component of this is the Community Connect program, which feeds directly into that pre-incident planning software. And what that does is it leverages uh, the use and the, the ability for the public to put in specific uh, information that would help us in times of emergency, which is something that we've collected for years, uh, but to have, and we've collected it on paper and then put it manually into our uh, software program in the station, that we use when responding to different buildings and homes and whatnot. So right now, this gives the power to the community to actually put in the data and more so, more, more of what we try to collect and feed right into this platform, which we use or will be using on responses, which is, which is great. So not only does it use uh, or put in contact information for the homeowners and businesses, but the homeowners can also put in if they have an at-risk population at home or pets or special information in the note section. And that all helps us at times of emergency to quickly identify if we have any other risks that we're, we're not aware of. And so this is a voluntary, um, this is a kind of a voluntary service that um, that's being rolled out, Chief? That's correct. And in terms of the nature of the data that you are asking to collect, could you give us some examples in addition to whether someone has a pet or a member of a vulnerable population, or um, maybe I could imagine someone with dis maybe impairment or? That's exactly uh, right. So if you have somebody that's physically disabled that has mobility issues or might have a, a loved one with a, a special medical condition, all of those can be input into this program and help us. Okay, and, and is there anything else that you are soliciting from residents in terms of this, um, what they would input for data? Uh, no, it's pretty clear and self-explanatory on the, on the Community Connect page once you log in and create an account. And 
all the data is encrypted at bank level encryption and it's not shared. It's only used for our response purposes. That's it. Okay. All right. Do my colleagues have any questions? Mr. Walner. Uh, two questions. One is um, potentially, wouldn't you share this with the police department or someone, I mean, who's in the safety business as well? Yeah, and we've that discussed that initially, Rich. So um, there was a little apprehension involved for, for different reasons. Uh, but we wanted to, where this is something that the fire, fire department has collected the entire time, basically for my entire career. Um, we took it to the next level with how it's integrated into another software platform. Um, I'm also looking at letting or, or creating a user profile for the water department. We're just trying to figure out at what layer that be allowed access and if we can even do that because with the information that we get, we want to make sure that it's kept very private. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, um, it, because it, cause I do have the water department to hook up as well. So we're starting to get like multiple now that I think about it, it's like multiple sites to be a responsible community member that I have to sign up for. So it's, you know, it gets a little hairy and my password list is like this long. Yeah, I, I can <laughs> so, understand. Uh, so integration in this case, you know, if I if I agree to it, you know, then it should be okay. It's just something for the future to think about is if I agree to share it with the police and everybody else like that, that would be up to me to decide, you know. So anyways, just a thought. Second thing is that after let's say I fill in all this information, are you going to at least annually go back to that person and say, this is what we have on file. Can you please keep it up to date? Because things change. And, you know, if they're not, if people aren't, people aren't necessarily going to think about, I signed up for my pet this year, but my pet is longer here. And then you're coming here three years later and you're looking for it and it's not there. So are you going to be doing a regular ping out to the people to let them know what they've signed up for so far? Yeah, we can do a we can do an email blast once we get a list of, uh, of people that have signed up, just to remind them to update their profile if they haven't done so, or to review it to make sure it's the most accurate. You know, and, and what's exciting is after reviewing the the profile today, uh, 165 residents have already signed up for the program through the community connect profile. So it's it's been pretty successful already, and we're happy to do it. Um, you know, at some point. Once this rollout happened, I wanted to approach the um, the town to see if they would also post this on their website and the school department as well. Because I think the more activity we get, you know, the better this program is going to work. And I think uh, I'm excited to see where we can where we can bring it. And I think it's going to be a really good opportunity uh, for all departments to leverage if we're able to create user profiles for them at different levels. Yeah. So again, just to, you know, from your for your sake as well, making sure that people understand what's on their profile and that they actually you're being proactive to say, this is what we have on file and let them confirm because otherwise you're looking for something that may not even be there. You know, or it, it, there may be hazards that you don't even know about that emerged from the time they signed up. So somehow or another, you're gonna have to have a proactive program to keep the data looking good. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Rich. And the beauty of this is the power is really in the people's hands. So they can, they have the power to put in as little or as much information that they want to. Like the town administrator has said, this, or, or the chair lady has said, that this is a voluntary program. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. Oh, thank you. Um... So Chief Stats, this brought my mind back to when I was young and before computers. <laughs> and we used to put the little foil fireman on your window if there was a child in the bedroom so that the fire department would know who the children's bedrooms were. So is that part of this that do you, do you tell on this like, is there like an outline of your house and where the bedrooms are? Is, does it get that involved? People can upload uh, attachments to this program. And we also, through our the first two side of the program, we already have a, a rough pre-plan for every building within North Reading already, which is, which is great. So it tells us the year it was built, what type of building it is, any kind of significant hazards that the assessors, assessing department might have on file. Um, 
where this goes to the next level is giving the public the opportunity to put in things that we would not know that are actually inside the structure. So okay. again, it's, it's really all within the people's hands. And there is a demographic in there to identify how many people under the age of 18 are in, are in the residence. Okay. <clears throat> all set? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good, okay. Any other questions? Good. Well, thanks, Chief, for um, explaining that. I have one other thing, because typically when someone is inputting data to the municipal website or service, it becomes public information. Are there any constraints that have, have been placed on this in terms of you know, um, preventing it from being subject to public record? I could see, easily see a database like that being some company or individual or organization submitting public records request for the data that's being collected in such a such a database is there anything that would prevent that first two has assured me that this data is all kept publicly it is not it, I, I don't know if it's subject to a public records request or not i don't believe it is but it is not sold it is not used in any other capacity than by our specific department for dispatching purposes. That is it. Okay. Okay. Are we all good with the questions? Well, thank you so much, Chief, for being here and explaining it to us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Thank right. you. Please, please sign up and use it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Um, I see Mrs. Diamond is here. If my colleagues wouldn't mind um, if we could just skip back to public comment. If Mrs. Diamond is going to, Mrs. Diamond, can you hear us? I can, yes. Hi, All good right. evening. Hi, good evening. Well, we know you were here, I guess, to probably advocate for the special election on the, uh, on the vocational school construction. So I, I certainly am. I, I'm hoping that everybody in town not only gets out and votes. Um, but if you know, have relatives or friends in the other communities, if you could reach out to them and ask them to get out and vote. This is a, a very, very important election for all the cities and towns and for the kids seeking vocational education, because this is a one-time deal. This doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. And that would be a terrible thing for all students seeking vocational education. Okay, Mrs. Diamond, when is the election? The election is on January 25th. The polls are open at St. Teresa's Church and the hours of the election in all cities in town is from 11 to six. Okay, all right, thank you. And well, I, I for... thank the Board of, the Board of Selectmen and, and everyone in town that has been vocal and supporting it. And we look forward to a, a great uh, outcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us. Just as a, Madam Chair, just as a, again, in addition to that, you know, it's important to remind the public that, you know, town meeting unanimously supported this, uh, this initiative at, at town meeting, which was, I think we were the first community to, to jump on board and we did it unanimously. It was just two other communities that are forcing the special election. Each and every vote counts. In other words, it's a majority of those that are present voting in, across all the communities. So it's important to have a, a good turnout here in North Reading in support of this uh, initiative. And uh, again, I want to uh, acknowledge Mrs. Diamond's uh, initiative here and also sacrifice because she's chairing this building committee and uh, well aware that she's got a you know, busy schedule ahead of her and lots of hours to be put in. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, asset to our community. Uh, vocational education is so important. Many of our kids benefit from it. And more kids will benefit from it. There's already a waiting list to over 600 students trying to get in there because the, the facility can't handle the demand. So this is a, an opportunity that we can uh, do it at the cheapest price that we possibly can. The state is coming up with unprecedented money uh, for this particular uh, project. So we should get out there and support it. And again, it's only from what, 11 to six. Uh, That's right. Time. So it's a short, short window, short, short opportunity and we should take advantage of it and everybody I should get out there and support it. Thank you, Stephen, very much. You've been very supportive and we appreciate that. Everyone in North Reading has been supportive. It was such an honor for me 
to be a town meeting when it was voted unanimously. Uh, and we truly thank those communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You see a hand raised and that's Mrs. Hurlbut. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, Judy is right. This is an extraordinarily important thing that we need to all vote in the affirmative. However, my question is, um, is it all in-person voting or will we be able to cast some strange and wonderful mail-in ballot? I believe you can get an absentee ballot. That was my recollection when Mrs. When Clerk, when yeah. our when we last clerk. Is that right, Mr. Gilberto? I believe absentee, but I do not believe that there's any sort of general mail-in or early voting. Early voting, really, right. It's really the absentee. 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 I believe it's really the absentee voting process. Is yes, it, that's right. That's that's what we've understood. Is it absentee without fibbing and saying you're going to Disneyland or something? <laughs> Before, I think people might be, be afraid of COVID. Of, I think we're in the middle of winter and we're in the middle of COVID and this is such yeah. an important election. We really need to get it out there. There's lots of stuff on the North Reading Community Connection about the importance of this election. There's lots of stuff everywhere about it, but there's very little about how you vote. A surprisingly little amount about it. So I, I, you know, I think we really need to work on that in the next week or two. I, that that's probably a very good suggestion. I certainly will work on that from my end. Uh, Michael, can uh, the clerk's office put, post something on the uh, community page? Yeah, on the website. She has something on the uh, on the page here um, that we can get linked to the home page, and we'll uh, we'll we'll make sure it gets put out to folks. Um, the voter registration deadline passed. It was January 5th, so last week. Absentee va ballots available for qualified voters and the applications available on the website. But we will put it up on the homepage, blast email, and we'll put it out on Facebook as well tomorrow. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much. Good luck, Judy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. Our next order of business is to discuss the public services director position. There's a vote that may be taken to establish the public services director position. Um, and I will uh, turn it to you, Mr. Gilberto. I know that the board, the board had a strategic planning meeting and we heard Mr. Walner's presentation and this was uh, part of a recommendation that Mr. Walner made that we have this position in our charter and this position would be basically the director of all of our human services, uh, human services division. And the, it's a charter position and we, the board was 100% on board with that recommendation and suggestion. And um, I, I'll leave it to you, Mr. Gilbert, to explain what are we voting on what do we vote? Why are we voting? We have the position. Are we just voting to incorporate it now into our, you know, personnel and fund it? Thank you, Madam Chair. As you indicated, um, this discussion is a follow-up to the discussion that took place at the board's strategic planning meeting back in November. Uh, it was a discussion that reflected a couple of things. Um, I think first and foremost, the fact that um, we have uh, a commitment to a human services program known as the um, age-friendly communities program through the AARP and um, that we're, you know, we're looking to advance that, but also that we knew we were gonna be experiencing turnover in the Department of Elder Services, which we have now experienced with the retirement of uh, the director, Mary Prenny, who we wish well in her retirement. Um, and, those two items along with the board's um, longstanding desire to try to add some capacity um, at the uh, administration level and management level. There's been many discussions with regard to um, ways that that could happen, uh, including uh, assistant town administrator positions like that. Um, we took a step forward a couple of years ago with the creation of the public safety director position uh, by the board. Um, and um, this is a very similar type position uh, under the town charter, as you indicated, Madam Chair, 
Um, it is a position um, uh, within a division uh, of the town government. The town's um, operations being divided into four different categories, separate, um, separately held uh, by charter and by state law or the school department. So I'm not including them in this conversation because it's not identified in that fashion. But there are four different divisions. Um, the division of finance, um, which is headed by the finance director, the Division of Public Works, which is headed by the Public Works Director, the Division of Public Safety, headed by the um, Public Safety Director. And then there's a final division, uh, General Government Services, that is identified under the town's charter. Excuse me one second. Under the town's charter, the responsibility for this position um, and, and oversight of the divisions within the departments within this division lies with the town administrator unless otherwise assigned by the select board. Um, and so this uh, general government services division includes the town clerk, the town library, recreation, veteran services, and any appropriate additional public services as may be assigned by the charter or through bylaw um, with the oversight vested in the director or supervising board of the division of public services. In the absence of a director or a board, uh, the oversight is in the town administrator. So it's currently under my purview. So the board's discussion, I think, um, at the suggestion of Mr. Walner was to look to fill this position and to, I think, ultimately, um, either by bylaw or charter change, uh, clarify that uh, a number of other divisions ought be um, within this uh, one of which is elder services. Um, so I'll stop there for just a moment. I put this out because the board's discussion was such that um, we were looking to hold off on hiring um, an elder services director or similar type position um, so that we could have this discussion and come to some sort of conclusion with regard to the procedure moving forward. I, I will say I have had numerous conversations with um, Susan Tilton and Sherry Greer down at the senior center who have been great and um, understand that they're sort of working together, carrying things forward at the senior center, which is open um, and has had um, in-person programming, um, although um, depending upon staffing availability and schedule, some of it has had to be canceled in recent weeks. Um, but nonetheless, uh, brings us to this point for this conversation. Great. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Mr. Walner, to that. I'll just, no, you did a great job of introducing it, uh, 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 Michael. So um, I'll just say that the um, I think the reason why it's compelling is because um, our demographics are changing in town. We're experiencing major demographic uh, shifts, and uh, this is an opportunity to bring all of these individual departments together to work towards a common good. And so this director will help free Michael up from some of the, all the many thousands of responsibilities he has every day, but it'll also allow this group to work together uh, for a better whole for everybody. So I think it's just gonna provide the synergy we need to be effective going forward. And, for the community, that's a huge, huge impact for everybody. So that's the main thrust of this, this position. And the good news, it was already defined. We're just now filling that role. It was defined before. Someone was genius before who figured it out. We're just pointed out the obvious, that's all. Okay, so do we have a motion? We do. Madam Chair, I move to establish the position of Public Services Director effective February 14, 2022. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. So the next steps, Mr. Gilberto, would be uh, Madam Chair, through you, we would um, finalize a job description and, and advertise a posting for this vacant position. At the same time, we'll also be advertising the um, vacant um, grant coordinator position as well um, that we've uh, funded in a previous fiscal year, then had to withdraw the funding for for a year, and now I've reinstated as well. It's obviously something that's very timely. I believe we are at an advantage. Many communities are looking to hire that type of position as well. Our advantage is we've committed to funding it. Um, rather than relying on the state or federal funding to uh, to fund it. Um, and uh, we would look to implement the position, the new public services director, excuse me, general government services director, um, as um, as soon as possible. Um, and um, 
In doing so, there would probably be some interim arrangement in place uh, while we prepare the appropriate bylaw to uh, clarify the designations within that division to reflect the evolving nature of our government over the 50 years since the charter was written. Um, you know, I've spoken with the finance director with regard to uh, funding and, um, you know, we would need additional funding beyond the vacancy factor associated with not having filled the grant position. We believe we have that number uh, in play um, to address that, but it'll, you know, obviously we'll all come together depending upon the start date. Um, I know none of us like to be in this type of a situation outside of the budget process, but timing was such that um, with the vacancy being created and the departure, um, you know, the, the, it strikes us, I think it strikes us all that the moment is now to try to proceed with this. That's okay. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. All right. We are going to move on then to our next order of business, which is legal bills. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for November 2021 in the amount of 16,487.65 as follows. General 5648.15, Labor 4243.50, 20 Elm Street 2193.50, GIS Consulting 4402.50 for a total of 16,487.65. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve invoice number 11421 in the amount of $83,566.32 to Furman Gregory Diptola for legal services for the secondary school building project litigation. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? I just have a quick question, Mr. Gilberto, which would be we're within the, um, we're within our appropriation to pay this. In other words, we're within the sums of money we appropriated for this purpose in order to pay this invoicing. Um, Madam Chair, through you, yes, we are. I, I will prepare, however, a full update as to the remaining balance of funds for the board for the next meeting. I did not have an opportunity to do so today, but uh, we are well within our appropriations at this point to pay this bill. Okay, great. Okay, motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. O'Leary, any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. Is that it for legal bills, Mr. Studo? Yes. Those, those two? All right, and our next order of business is the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just bear with me while I scroll to the report. I'll refer to it to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, first, um, I, beyond my written report, uh, I'm pleased to let you know that Representative Jones has contacted me today to let me know that our special legislation relative to the cell towers and the revenue received from the cell towers uh, has been enacted and laid before the governor, I believe today. Um, and I, I just wanna note, you know, I, I know that we all have, um, you know, uh, the highest amount of respect for our legislative delegation, but Representative Jones is actually able to put us directly in, in touch with the Department of Revenue to answer questions they were posing, you know, to the legislature. Um, and to really clarify exactly what this was for and to avoid some potentially problematic changes to the bill that the legislature was considering. So I, I just wanna recognize and thank Representative Jones for that. It really made it straightforward because we, we have an eight year history that we're dealing with on this issue that you can't just make go away unless you do it by act of the legislature and the legislature is basically gonna work with us to correct this. And I, I just wanna recognize the effort and, and the attention that Representative Jones put into a bill that's otherwise routine and not terribly interesting um, for the rest of the the rest of the world and the legislature. Um, so I thank him for that. I want to Senator Tar and his staff for also staying on top of it. Um, I also will note that the Department of Housing and Community Development has recently released multifamily zoning guidelines. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I'm sure you're familiar with this with regard to what's going on in your community. The law was passed in 2020 um, requiring so-called MBTA communities um, to have or adopt a multifamily zoning district that meets a state standard. 
North Reading is not a community with direct MBTA services, but it, as most of you know, our status as an abutter to an MBTA community, two of them, <laughs> three of them, uh, requires that we comply with this law in order to continue to be eligible for many state grant funding sources, including MassWorks. Um, the town planner is working with town council to first determine if the zoning at Edgewood complies. However, if it does not, the CPC will begin working on a zoning bylaw amendment to ensure we do comply in a timely fascist, a fashion. And I um, attached the, an MMA article and a guidance from the from Coleman and Page um, that was provided um, in recent uh, recent weeks for your review, although I think some of you may be receiving those emails. Um, I was going to comment on the special election, but Ms. Diamond has already briefed you on that. Um, and then uh, I just want to let folks know that the fire chief continues to work on updating the town's hazard mitigation plan. Um, the, um, the link that I put in my report uh, will direct you to the town website where folks can review the plan and can provide comments as well to um, to the fire chief for inclusion in the draft. Um, and we're looking to get that approved um, in, the, in the coming months. It'll ultimately come back to the board for adoption as it did um, in its last round as well. That is a requirement that you as the executive uh, approve it. So I believe that completes my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, any questions from Mr. Gilberto? Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, did, did you want to comment on the wastewater? Yes, thank you. I'm sitting here thinking there's, you, some, there's I something that I, there was I something wanted to, add. to talk about a little bit. Yes, there was something okay. I wanted to add. I couldn't think of it. I was going to probably have to raise my hand at the end and say I thought of it finally. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Um, yes, um, there is a you know an update with regard to to wastewater, the water and wastewater project. Um, we've had we're meeting every few weeks at this point, including a meeting this morning, um, and. Um, you know, mo most notably, we have reached the end of the procurement process for um, a vendor, a consultant to come in and help us with both uh, financial modeling and uh, projecting the growth in the community associated with this. Um, the good news is we've identified what we believe to be a very capable, and qualified firm. Uh, we had a number of firms express interest, but in the end, it only came down to one firm that submitted a proposal in accordance with the process. We were, we were pleased with the firm. Um, unfortunately, the pricing uh, came in much higher than we were budgeting. We had it budgeted at around $100,000 and their proposal came in at $219,000. Um, so while uh, we weren't happy with that, um, we did have some conversation about where we might be able to achieve some savings. And, and really the outcome was that we could look to either to, to, re to remove or reduce public outreach and potentially to remove um, research into Title V information relative to the flow for the wastewater. Um, the flow for the wastewater, we feel we can get our arms around pretty easily through available water use information in our system, which you all know is pretty advanced. Um, we can look at the past five years data and really understand the flow pretty easily without likely needing to do the Title V review. The public outreach though is obviously a critical component of what we were looking for from this. And we all felt that that's not something that we should be reducing. Fortunately, we do have a substantial buffer in the budget with regard to this uh, from the appropriation at October town meeting. And I, I do expect that we will be able to enter into a contract for, if not the full 219,000, it'd be somewhere around $210,000 if we did not go forward with the Title V review. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm bringing that to the attention of folks because, you know, we've exceeded the cost in one line of the slide that we went through in the town meeting prep, uh, presentation, uh, but we have about a $400,000 buffer based on what we ended up having to contract the design for with uh, Wright Pierce. Um, so, you know, we, we feel that we have, um, we have space to, to absorb this and, and still be okay. Um, I'll also note that, again, this project becomes more and more real every day. Um, the community is going to be seeing from the town hall a notice about surveying that will begin on the corridor, mainly Main Street and Concord Street, uh, as well as Park Street, connecting the two. Um, so you're going to start to see activity in the community associated with the planning on this project. And they're looking to begin boring in, um, in February um, to determine what's uh, on the subsurface in the whole route. So um, you know, it's moving. I'm pleased to report that it is moving forward. Um, we have a very tight, aggressive timeline, and we're doing everything we can to meet that timeline. Uh, and we will continue to keep the board apprised uh, as that project progresses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. 
Thank you, Mr. Right. Alvarez. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Just, just, just a comment in relation to uh, the price that came in. And I think it's important to note that from the time we uh, made the presentation at town meeting to the time that we put out the request for proposals, the request for bids here, we significantly expanded the uh, scale and scope of, of the project that we're looking for. Um, everything from the public outreach to uh, what are the betterments going to look like and doing some analysis as far as, uh, well, I won't get into the details, but we, 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 we expanded it significantly. So while we are, um, we were somewhat surprised by the cost, we were surprised that the cost was above what we had anticipated and presented at town meeting. But again, we did build in a significant amount of cushion um, to you know, address any unforeseen expenses and um, potential change orders down the line. And we still believe that we have uh, sufficient funds available to, to finish uh, the scope of the project to make it a, a well-informed presentation uh, so the public can make a, an informed decision uh, next fall. So. We're happy that it's moving forward again. It, town administrator pointed out very aggressive schedule, um, multiple multiple facets going on at the same time, and um, it's heartening to see that we're this far along. So this is exciting. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All set. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. We're on to board member reports, and we can usually tack tack on all the new business with that, Mr. Studo. Really think you're good, Mrs. Gonzalez. All set, Mr. Walner. Um, just on the forest committee, we uh, found a potential consultant resource uh, down near the Cape. They've done a project similar to what we're hoping to do here in town here for the Swan Pond area. And uh, we're planning to do a walk with that person uh, on the 21st um, to just get a scope of that and get a feeling for that. Um, what it, the it's biggest warm is, for you. I hope it's warm for the walk. <laughs> I hope it's warm too. Not Arctic, not an Arctic chill that day. Yeah, I know it could be cold, but we're trying to get it done because uh, we're trying to hit some deadlines too. Uh, the big thing is from the funding and it, what we're trying to figure out. There isn't a lot of mapping in the Swan Pond area, so that would be part of what they'd be bringing forward is the mapping, and it, you can qualify for funding if it has inter town um, connections. So if it, if it not only benefits your town, but benefits other towns in one way or another, then you can get some public, uh, some public funding, it appears you can. Uh, but we don't know if we have that access point or not. Um, so some of us think we don't, we're just not sure. So that would be part of the, part of the um, uh, consultant role is just to figure out where our paths and where they lead. If not, we'd be funding it ourselves. But the fund, you know, just to even fund the consultant ourselves and get this done is not outrageously priced. I mean, I, I hate, hesitate to name the price, but it's just not an outrageously priced for bringing up a natural resource that we have that many people in the community don't even know how to get to, don't know how to access it, don't know how to walk around. When we get this consultant in place, we make it more accessible. Um, you know, the price that it would cost would be worth it. So more to come, but we're, we have a good crew who's working on it actively every month. And I'm excited about that. And it'd be nice to bring another amenity to town that isn't usually utilized. That's it. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Well, let's see. We I talked about water health. Yeah, I know. We, you covered there. Uh, we talked about wastewater, so we're good. We covered yeah. there. And uh, let's see, what else did we talk about? Well, we talked about that. So uh, just a couple of other. Oh, we talked about yeah, the special election uh, for the regional school, too. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, just I was able to uh, participate in the wonderful set off from Mary Prenny, and I know she appreciated uh, everybody that showed up. And with a limited time span, everybody had less than 15 minutes to come in, appreciate her, tell her how much you appreciated her. And it was a wonderful set off, and, uh, and she was beaming from ear to ear through the whole, the whole, the whole event. So uh, congratulations to Mary, and much success in her next endeavors, you know, as she's looking out from the 32nd floor at Harbor Towers. Um, the other thing was, um, I just we, we should mention the fact that uh, the DPW did a fantastic job with the storm, and sure. we're fortunate again that we had uh, the contractors, and again, again to uh, Joe Parisi and, uh, and Chris Deming, you know, their ability to secure necessary contractors to assist us, and our uh, removal of snow is no small feat, and to be congratulated uh, 
for what they've been able to accomplish and hopefully gets us through the winter here. Uh, they, they did a very good job of, uh, under the circumstances. And then lastly, uh, and again, on a sad note, since our last meeting, uh, the passing of Neil Rooney, uh, who was a uh, oh, yeah. longtime member of the community here, who was a yeah. longtime public servant, again, through youth sports and organizations, but uh, also a uh, longtime member of the Community Planning Commission, uh, had an untimely uh, passing uh, just after our meeting last time. And you know, our condolences go out to his to our Kathy and son, Neil. And again, uh, appreciate their sharing him with us for the number of years that he did and the contributions that he made. And it was gonna be sadly missed. And so just wanted to acknowledge that. That's it, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Um, I do wanna ask the members if we could pull out our calendars and see if we, <laughs> we can reschedule the strategic planning. I mean, should we give it a shot? Seven uh -huh. times a charm? Well, I, I, Madam Chair, I, my suggestion would be, you know, let's see how the, how the numbers are looking forward you know uh, you want to give it a give it a wait give it a little bit give it a yeah. give it another give it another month or so uh, i think so just to, yeah. really to uh sure sure what's occurring, All right. what's occurring. Okay. and then i just i think we we'd want to also wait to hear what the board of health is saying i feel like we made quite a bit of progress the first meeting we, no, we did I think, I think with a significant amount of progress and again yeah. and while it's great to do it uh, in person uh, I think we should capitalize on the progress we've made. And if we have to do it virtually, we should do it. We just have to uh, break bread over over Zoom. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you know, because something I, I think that, we did Something make about the in-person manner of strategic planning that just simply works. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. So. Yeah. But all right, so I, I with that, well, well, let's give it. Well, maybe we'll just plan it next our next board meeting. So everyone has the schedule. Mrs. McNeil sent us out the schedule, and with that, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Well, I'll second that. Maybe we should oh, do this more often. Motion <laughs> by <laughs> Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mrs. Tristudo. Aye. And Yupeli is aye. All right. Good night, folks. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.